good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending this lecture. My name is Esan Muallem, and I am going to uh, talk about the spirituality today and uh, the evidences that have been found on this topic. During my lecture today, I played three different lectures online from different three different independent sources, and we listened to together to their findings. The intention of this talk today is to inform you about some real and true facts that have been recorded in scientific findings that I think we have to pay attention to them. These findings suggest that there is something about an unknown aspect of human being that uh, cannot be explained by regular medical or physical uh, explanation of our current understanding of reality. Um, First, uh, what is a spirituality? We have, first, we have to have a definition of what we want to talk about. Um, there are many definitions for spirituality. One definition is, spirituality is connecting to a higher aspect of ourselves, a higher aspect of consciousness, which we cannot have access to via our regular, five regular senses, like vision or hearing, etc. Then the question is, if we cannot analyze it and sense it and feel it with the five regular senses, how can we know that it exists, or how can we know it's real at all? We are going to, uh, we are we are going to try to answer this question today. Actually, the example, uh, uh, the concept is similar to the following example. We all know that we cannot observe electrons, for example, with our uh, visions or any of our five regular senses, but we know that they do exist because we can perform numerous experiments to verify their existence. So the same concept is true about the spirituality. If we have to rely on experiments or facts to convince ourselves at least that they exist. And today we are going to see some of these um, experiments and experiences. Actually the spirituality suggests that an entity exists inside ourselves called the spirit. Um, spirit or soul or a special entity or multidimensional aspect of ourselves or multidimensional interaction of a quantum field energy with a space-time realm, whatever you want to call it. An entity exists within ourselves that its abilities expand beyond the three-dimensional physical limits of our body. We can have access to extraordinary information or have paranormal experiences kind of where this entity but by the way, there is, a, there is currently a branch of psychology called parapsychology. Uh, it's an academic major that uh, studies these documented experiments and abilities uh, in some universities. In other words, if we, don't, uh, and if we don't believe in existence of something called the spirit, then we are not talking about a spirituality anymore. We are just talking about the regular perception of reality. Because this is, this, entity, this, this multidimensional energy or whatever it is, is the source and tool for having these experiences or, or abilities. Or in another definition, we can say spirituality is about methods or techniques to discover uh, this higher aspect of ourself or to connect to these aspects. Uh, what aspects we are talking about? For example, uh, intuition power, for example, or even ability to predict the future. Um, we are not talking about science fiction. Some of you might already know about your uh, intuition power or telepathic communication that some of you might be able to have with your loved ones or with your spouse or with your parents or your siblings. Um, or s some of you might know that some animals have a great sense, we call it sixth sense, that they can, uh, we can notice some catastrophic events before it happens. Actually, the human being have all these abilities too, but we have been so out of touch with these uh, kind of abilities since we are too busy with our numerous daily life businesses. And spirituality is about reestablishment of these connections to uh, these abilities that uh, expand beyond our five regular senses. One of the methods used in the spirituality is meditation. I, uh, I know that some of you might be very familiar with this powerful tool to access your inner powers. 
But I have to explain a little bit in here because there is some misconception in this context. Uh, sometimes when I talk to people, I notice that some of them think that the meditation is the same as relaxation. Actually, it is not. It is much more than that. Here's an example. If I'm a, suppose I imagine that I'm a, if I'm a 100% materialist person, I still agree that, uh, and I don't believe in existence of anything like a spirit or anything like that, I still agree that relaxation is very good. Actually, everybody agrees that relaxation is very good and useful. You sit quietly at the end of the day and free your mind from anxieties and stresses and the worries that you carry along with you during the day they are related to your past or to your future. However, when we are talking about uh, meditation, we assume that the person has an entity, that entity that tries to connect to it via a real process of meditation. In, in sort of speak, you are, you are trying to awaken those abilities. So I think right now you understand that they are different. In other words, if I'm a 100% materialist person, and I don't believe in anything beyond the interaction of mind-body, everything that happens around me or inside my world is just a series, series of physical differential equations that happens in my world around me, or um, uh, biochemical reactions that happens inside my cells and my nerve system, or hormone activities inside my bloodstream. But uh, meditation is only meditation. If we assume that such an entity exists within that person or that within every of us, if we try to connect to it with this process. Otherwise, it's just a relaxation of mind-body. So everything comes down to this fact. Does an entity called a spirit or multi-dimensional energy or whatever it is exist inside ourselves or not? Um, if we can show with the evidences or experiments that such an entity exists within ourselves, then we have to say, well, yes, now the spiritual people have a point here. Then we have to pay attention to them because if we have to pay attention to this new entity because um, Years of years of our academic studies have not taught us even a little bit about what this entity is, or what is the characteristics, and um, what is its abilities, and so on. Um, by the way, I have to mention here that I was a hardcore scientist like you uh, before, and uh, my favorite quote was, show me a paper about what you're talking about, or don't waste my time and yours. I'm still the same person, but I have seen so many evidences about it existence of this entity that I cannot deny myself, uh, deny any more that it probably exists. And we really have to search and find and know more about that. They don't teach you in this, this thing in a school. You have to find it yourself. The first talk is a warm-up about how to, um, how can we tap into a more conscious aspect of our being that exists within every of us, actually. Um, the first step in this road is to uh, stop the mind chattering uh, that makes, uh, that uh, keeps our mind busy all through the day, actually. This uh, continuous flowing stream of memories and worries and anxieties that, that flows into our logic and rational analysis part of our brain just keep our, keep our mind busy and doesn't let our mind come down for a while and, and uh, doesn't let us to live in a peaceful and silent mind. For example, as you're sitting here listening to my uh, lecture, you might just uh, remember that this evening you should do this and that, or you might just remember about the deadline of your project, or the argue you had with your friend this morning, and so on and on and on. This continuous flowing stream of memories it just flows into our mind, does not let us uh, to live in a conscious mind, in a peaceful mind, and just calm down for a while and enjoy the present moment. So imagine that how wonderful it could be if your mind has a button that you could press it, and then temporarily, just for a few minutes, uh, there is no flowing stream of memories and deadlines and worries. Just you can live in the middle of a silent and peaceful mind. How wonderful that could be. By the way, this is a, one of the 
I think this is one of the benefits that meditation can offer us. To stop this mind chattering whenever we want. And we are going to, uh, however, we are not going to uh, listen to a spiritual person who does meditation today. We are going to listen to a, um, a scientific person like ours, um, which has, uh, even better, a neuroscientist that has spent years of her life on studying the different parts of the brain and interaction of different parts with one another. And we listen to uh, the findings, to her, to her, uh, listen together to her findings. By the way, I should say that before I, I read these kind of experiments and these reports, um, you know, these documents, I was always when I when I used to hear a, a spiritual person who talks about his wonderful feeling of of uh, ha having accessing this high level of consciousness and peace, peaceful state, I was very skeptic. I was thinking that oh, this guy has a hallucination; and doesn't know what he's talking about. But then I found that uh, scientists, especially neuroscientists and psychiatrists, which are very familiar with different versions of mental disorder, like a schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, or they're, they're very familiar with a different kind of psychological disorder, like, a let's, like um, daydreaming and hallucination and these sort of things. Even they are claiming, ha and, uh, having observed this, uh, accessing this uh, conscious vivid experience of ha uh, accessing this higher level of consciousness, actually I found the analysis and the reports very, very convincing. Um, today we are going to uh, listen to some of them. There are much more on the internet you can find if you wish. The first talk is, a, is about 20 minutes uh, given by Dr. Jill Taylor, neuroanatomist from Harvard Department of Psychiatry. Um, she explains um, how the left and right hemisphere of our brain works and how they interact with one another and what a tremendous shift in our consciousness happens if we can stop the left hemisphere of your brain from working, that mind chattering that we, are talk we, we, we just talked about. Uh, left hemisphere of brain are, is mostly responsible for language center, the memory section, the logic and analysis part of the brain or uh, part of the personality and self-identification. Self and instead, stop this part from, uh, from working or from functioning and keep our right hemisphere of your brain intact and active which is most responsible for our sensory system, kinetics of movement of our body, perception of reality, imagination, these sort of things. And we will, I want you to, uh, when you're watching this lecture, I want you to pay close attention to this part of the talk uh, when her, uh, her, her, her mind, uh, actually her left hemisphere is off and how how can meditation somehow help us to get to this silent and peaceful mind and stop our mind chattering? Also, the second aspect of her talk touches a little bit on the subject of near-death experience, which is a set of another sort of evidence for existence of the spirit, actually. Near-death experience, actually, in contrary to its title, is not frightening or scary at all. Actually, it is very uh, peaceful and pleasant to hear about. We're going to see in the, in the lectures that we're going to watch today that near-death experience actually are uh, kind of paranormal, paranormal experiences that some people that have uh, had a catastrophic life-threatening effect have vividly perceived and have, have experienced. Uh, there, there are now many documented cases that uh, the people report a sense of peacefulness and joy and freedom while having these experiences. And they often report that they didn't want to come back to their body due to the beauty and, and the warmth and, and joyfulness of this new space. A, a feeling of oneness with all there is outside. So I stop talking any, uh, more and I'll, j I'll let, you, uh, let you hear let you listen to the lecture yourself. I just want to emphasize and pay close attention to the consciousness she's experiencing when the mind chattering is off and also uh, the peaceful and wonderful experience of union and just joyful experience of reunion and uh, oneness with the rest of the world in her near-death experience. Dr. G. Walter Taylor from Harvard Department of Psychiatry. I grew up 
to study the brain because I have a brother who has been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. And as a sister and later as a scientist, I wanted to understand why is it that I can take my dreams, I can connect them to my reality, and I can make my dreams come true. What is it about my brother's brain and his schizophrenia that he cannot connect his dreams to a common and shared reality, so they instead become delusion? So I dedicated my career to research into the severe mental illnesses, and I moved from my home state of Indiana to Boston, where I was working in the lab of Dr. Francine Bennis in the Harvard Department of Psychiatry. And in the lab, we were asking the question, what are the biological differences between the brains of individuals who would be diagnosed as normal control as compared with the brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or bipolar disorder? So we were essentially mapping the microcircuitry of the brain, which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals, and then in what quantities of those chemicals. So there was a lot of meaning in my life because I was performing this type of research during the day, but then in the evenings and, and on the weekends, I traveled as an advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. Thank you. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past, and it's all about the future. 
Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information, associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned, and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you gotta remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am, I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding <coughs> pain behind my left eye. And it was the kind of pain, caustic pain, that you get when you bite into ice cream. And it just gripped me, and then it released me. And then it just gripped me, and then it released me. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain, so I thought, okay, I'll just start my normal routine. So I got up and I jumped onto my cardio glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. And I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body, and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. It was all very peculiar, and my headache was just getting worse, so I get off the machine, and I'm walking across my living room floor, and I realize that everything inside of my body has slowed way down. And every step is very rigid and very deliberate. There's no fluidity to my pace, and there's this constriction in my area of perception, so I'm just focused on internal systems. And I'm standing in my bathroom, getting ready to step into the shower, and I could actually hear the dialogue inside of my body. I heard a little voice saying, okay, you muscles, you gotta contract, and you muscles, you relax. And, and then I lost my balance, and I'm propped up against the, the wall. And I looked down at my arm, and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end, because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind. But then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online and it says to me, hey, we got a problem, we got a problem, we gotta get some help. And I'm going, no, oh, I got a problem, I got a problem. So it's like, okay, okay, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back out into the consciousness and I affectionately refer to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space, and my job and any stress related to my, my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and any stressors related to any of those, they were gone. And I felt this sense of peacefulness. And imagine what it would feel like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. Oh, I felt euphoria 
euphoria. It was beautiful there. And then again, my left hemisphere comes online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention. We've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help. I've got to focus. So I get out of the shower and I mechanically dress. I'm walking around my apartment and I'm thinking, I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. Can I drive? Can I drive? And in that moment, my right arm went totally paralyzed by my side. Then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. And then the next thing my brain says to me is, wow. This is so cool. <laughs> this is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study their own brain from the inside out? <laughs> and then it crosses my mind. But I'm a very busy woman. I don't have time for a stroke. It's like, OK, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two, and then I'll get back to my routine. Okay, so I gotta call help, I gotta call work. I couldn't remember the number at work. So I remembered, in my office, I had a business card with my number on it. So I go into my business room, and I pull out a three inch stack of business cards. And I'm looking at the card on top, and even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not, because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. But then I would drift back out into La La Land and not remember if when I come back if I'd already dialed those numbers. So I had to wield my paralyzed arm like a stump and cover the numbers as I went along and pushed them so that as I would come back to normal reality, I'd be able to tell, yes, I've already dialed that number. Eventually, the whole number gets dialed, and I'm listening to the phone, and my colleague picks up the phone, and he says to me, roo, roo, roo. <laughs> gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, oh, oh, oh. and I think, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. So he recognizes that I need help and he, and he gets me help. And a little while later, I'm, I'm riding in an ambulance from one hospital across Boston to Mass General Hospital. And I curl up into a little fetal ball. And just like a balloon with the last, last bit of air just, just right out of the balloon, I just felt my energy lift and just, I felt my spirit surrender. And in that moment, I knew that I was no longer the choreographer of my life, and either the doctors rescue my body and give me a second chance at life, or this was perhaps my moment of transition. When I woke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life, and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Stimulation coming in through my sensory systems felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space, I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. Nirvana, I found 
nirvana. And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive, and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana, and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana. And I pictured a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time and that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. Two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage, the surgeons went in and they removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball that was pushing on my language centers. Here I am with my mama, who's a true angel in my life. It took me eight years to completely recover. So who are we? We are the life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds and we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. Right here, right now, I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere where we are. I am the life force power of the universe. I am the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form. And one with all that is. Or... I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere, where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, intellectual, neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which do you choose? and when. I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deep inner peace circuitry of our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world and the more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth spreading. Thanks. As you saw, Dr. Taylor explained in detail how her experience was in a totally silent and peaceful mind. Um, I think all of us agree that how wonderful being in the middle of silent and peaceful mind, this conscious state, could be. And I think that meditation or any other technique can, that can offer us this, this conscious state, um, this peaceful and this reunion and reunity with the rest of the world is worth trying. Let's um, move to the second part of my talk here, um, which is uh, also uh, investigates different uh, aspects of near-death experience. Uh, this talk is given by um, Dr. Bruce Grayson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Grayson has studied uh, more than 1,000 cases of near-death experiences. Um, and I think he's one of the top ten people in the world who, who are qualified to talk about the real nature of near-death experience since he has studied the details of these documented cases personally. There are also um, other researchers that are pioneer of these near-death experiences study, like Dr. Sampania, Dr. Peter Fenwick, and others. Um, and they also have found uh, findings very similar to Dr. Grayson's. 
However, our time is not uh, enough to get into all of these research. I will just show you one, and you can find the rest on, in the internet if you wish. Dr. Bruce Grayson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. The most common example that's talked about now is the near-death near death experience. We have people, many people who seem to be clinically dead, a few people who actually had flat brain waves documented, who come back saying, not only was I thinking, but I was thinking more clearly than I ever had before. But we also have other examples of cases in which when the brain is compromised, people think more clearly. There are exceptional cases of people who have irreversible dementia or severe mental illness who in their dying moments before they die become perfectly lucid. They start recognizing family members, they start talking coherently, they lose their delusions, and then they die. What is that all about? We don't have a materialistic explanation for this. If you assume that mind and brain can separate when the brain starts to deteriorate, then you have an explanation. You can't do a lot of research on that type of experience. Those are just isolated anecdotes, and believe me, they are unusual. Most people who die with dementia die with dementia. They don't come out of it. But we have these isolated cases that tell us something else is going on. But with the near-death experience, we have a potentially researchable lab to look at what's happening when the brain goes down. Now, we have ways of extending the life of the brain, for example, by hypothermia, by giving it different drugs to reduce its need for oxygen so it can keep going for longer. And you can argue about how dead is dead. But as Sam Carney mentioned this morning, if you get down to the point where you have an isolated neuron, an isolated nerve cell still functioning, does it make sense to say that neuron is hungry or is angry or has consciousness? We don't think so. How about if you have two cells connected together? Can they be hungry? Most neuroscientists think you need an entire intact neural network to have anything like consciousness. And clearly that is not going on when you have perhaps some rudimentary brain activity in the deep brainstem. Whatever you have, if you have any brain activity, it's not what we usually think is required for consciousness. So we have brains that are not functioning well enough to produce consciousness, and yet we have people saying, I was conscious throughout the whole procedure. In fact, I was more clear then than when I'm stuck back here in the brain with all the limitations of the brain on me. Is there anything that's verifiable in all this? We have people saying to us, yes, I was thinking clearer than ever before, that was more real than this. How do we know that there's anything to any of this? Well, occasionally people bring back from any near-death experience some verifiable information. And so this is the same thing that Sam is trying to do with this AWARE study, trying to put targets that are unexpected in places where people can see when they leave their bodies. And we have lots of anecdotes of people who have done this, who have said, yes, I left my body, and I saw Dr. So-and-so kick over the stand, or I saw this or that, and they're accurate. And sometimes they are very surprising things that they report to us, things they couldn't possibly have guessed. We also have people bringing back from a near-death experience information they couldn't have, gotten, couldn't have gotten about other things as well. Sometimes they have met and communicated with deceased loved ones who have told them information that they couldn't have gotten in other way. There are cases of people who have met these deceased loved ones that no one knew had died. And we have many cases of documented this where people who talked about seeing deceased relatives included Uncle Joe, who everyone thought was still alive. And you didn't find out until days later that Uncle Joe had died a few minutes before this person has a near-death experience. How do we explain these things in terms of neurological function? So these are ways in which, from a near-death experience, you can get some verifiable information, which can bear on the question of, are these things, quote, real? Well, this talk was a part of uh, a new foundation panel discussion on September 2008, and 
on uh, United Nations Symposium. The title of the talk was Beyond the Mind-Body Problem, New Paradigms in Science of Consciousness. As we continue reading about these reports and documents, we run into serious problems if we want to explain every aspect of our being with just the interaction of mind-body. Uh, in these near-death near experiences, the heart has stopped for more than a few minutes, the brain has stopped functioning since the brain, brain electrical wave has recorded zero activity, all flat lines, and still the patient cl uh, claims that he ha they have perception of reality, and most astonishing, in a very different way. Uh, the current level of science, uh, or medical science have no explanation for these cases. I think we, we really have to uh, search and know more about them. The, the, not the science should, should more, know more about them, which is of course obvious, but actually ourselves as individuals, I think we have the right to know about these things. And there are, there are lots of information on the internet that you can find it, uh, if you wish. I'd like to move on to the third part of my talk today, which is uh, also addresses again near-death experience, different aspects of near-death experience again. This uh, third talk is actually is a documentary report that uh, interviews some of the people that have had near-death experience in the United States, about 15 minutes. Uh, actually, Do Dr. Jeffrey Long, radiation oncologist, has uh, uh, studied has studied some of these cases and has established a research foundation, the Earth Experience Research Foundation, that, uh, to study and investigate and document the details of these cases. So we'll listen to that, and I'll be back. Okay. Dr. Jeffrey Long and Near Death Experience Research Foundation. <laughs> Near-death experience may be defined as a lucid experience that occurs at a time of an imminent life-threatening event. And yet, at a time of unconsciousness, people are having these vivid, lucid experiences. In a moment, I was just somewhere else. All of a sudden, I heard a voice. I did not want to believe this. I live my life through that experience. There's millions of Americans that have had a near-death experience. They're not rare. When I first heard about near-death experiences, I thought they were so fantastic that I wanted to believe this, but an extraordinary claim like that requires extraordinary evidence. I, I certainly understand people's skepticism about this. If, if it hadn't happened to me, I'd be skeptical about it too. Was I just suffering from hypoxia, which is just oxygen starvation of the brain? Was it something that could have brought about this hallucination? I sat there and thought to myself, this story just sounds crazy. This just nobody's going to believe this. I mean, I was a pretty big spiritual skeptic, and, um, and to say those things or to even think about that experience was just, it was a lot for me to take in. I did not want to believe this, but I've been in the presence of dying people more than any skeptic I've ever met, and I have argued with the best of them. It's a global type of experience, and we have tons of people from all over the world who have submitted their near-death experience. My near-death experience happened in 1998. We were down on the beach running around, having a good time, and I had a really bad allergic reaction. Everything was, was just locking down inside my body, and I was going into shock. I just kept saying to myself, I've got to breathe. I've got to breathe. I've got to breathe. My dad and I were at the Shawnee Mission, Kansas Department of Motor Vehicles. Leaving the building when I unexpectedly fell into and through his arms and into the sidewalk outside. A uniformed nurse happened to be walking by. She determined I didn't have a pulse. I didn't seem to be breathing. I was dead on the sidewalk. I found myself going on this white water rafting trip on the south fork of the Bay River, Idaho. Almost immediately, we got into trouble. The raft went perpendicular, and the guys in the front of the raft fell back and hit me. I actually felt my my body shut down. I was just making breakfast for my kids in my own kitchen, and I slipped on a spot of oil or something, and I fell to my knees. And when that happened, it jolted me so severely that I blacked out. 
All I knew was when I woke up, I was flat on my back, and I was paralyzed from the waist down. My stomach started to swell up like a balloon. From what the doctors could see, everything just shut down. My heart stopped, my breathing stopped. I just quit on it. I was in the second to the fast lane on the freeway. Not one, what, 130, zipping along 65. There wasn't a lot of folks out. And I looked down, all of a sudden, here's the rear tires of this car, right there. And I'm just like, <laughs> so I dove to the I dove to the right side of the car, and everything just slowed. And then you could hear the glass, and you could hear the impact, the, the screeching tires. And just this area is just incredible, just the amount of impact that you get. Of course, the folks from the freeway came up, poked their head in the windows, and looked at me and said, man, I think this guy's dead. I was invited to uh, go on a float trip of Hell's Canyon. It was a beautiful day, and everybody was really happy to be there. All of a sudden, we were in Class 5 rapids, which are the biggest rolling rapids, and the raft that we were on completely turned over. I was caught underneath the raft. I think I remember saying, well, Libby, I guess this is it. Like, signing off. <laughs> I think what drives my belief was the overwhelming consistency of the NDE elements and of what NDE ears are telling us. Very commonly, the first event in an NDE is a separation of consciousness, that being their point of vision and what they could hear actually separates from the body. Boom, I was back up sitting in the corner of this room, looking at my body, which is still laying there on this table. You're not really floating. It's not like floating. You're, you're actually standing, and then you're up. And you could look around and see things that are happening. First, I heard a woman's voice saying, I'm not getting a pulse, I'm not getting a pulse. And I turned to her, and with the same sense of reality with which I am now speaking, I said, of course you're getting a pulse, otherwise I wouldn't be talking. I had no sense of being in physical danger at all. Following that, commonly in near-death experiences, they'll go through a tunnel. And as they go to the end of that tunnel, uh, they may encounter a light, they may encounter a being. And following that, they can often be in some unearthly, or if you will, heavenly realm. I was whirling through this, this tunnel, and there were these light streaks that I was kind of going by. And I was coming out into this big, sort of luminous, gray-white cloud. This is the point of the experience when it's really difficult to really articulate um, the events that happened because um, any terms I use are not going to be all that accurate. And then there was a light that came that blew away all the gray foggy material and talk about no words uh, it was it was so bright i could see it was so bright it was brighter than our sun but no squinting it was all love it sounds so i don't know i i have never found a way to talk about this light it just took my breath away. I just had to sit there for a moment and think about how beautiful this place was. That was the real world there. You know, that was really home. Following that, there's often a life review. Life reviews occur in about a fourth of near-death experiences. The review was everything that ever happened to me. And yet it seemed to happen in just a matter of moments, and I saw it from three perspectives simultaneously. It was as though I was looking through my own eyes, experiencing it again as I first had. And then I was experiencing it through the eyes of everyone with whom I never interacted. And then it was sort of this sort of omniscient viewpoint where I could see everything. I got absolutely no judgment whatsoever. What I got was this tidal wave that hit me of this feeling of unconditional love and acceptance. I began to notice that there was someone in front of me. This person had been with me through every decision that I had made, and, and it was the most natural conversation when we began to speak. 
Uh, it was the most natural thing in the world to me. We started talking about my life up to that point, but there wasn't any blame attached to it. It was almost more a matter of, well, I've done these things, but there's things I haven't done. Now, at the same time this is all happening, I am moving around a series of like light bins, would be the best way to put it. And I know that if I go far enough around the light bins, I won't be coming back this way. Very often your death experiencers will then be involved in a choice as to whether to leave this heavenly, joyous realm that they're in and return to Earth. Someone definitely from outside of me put a question to me that commanded an answer. And the question was, Libby, are you ready? The feeling that I was getting was that it was okay, either way. I could die or I could live and everything's gonna be just fine. I was being told that if I went through that window, I would not go back. I was having a great time. I was, I was in heaven. I started to say yes. And then unbeknownst and unexpectedly to myself, out came the answer, no, I can't go, I haven't finished yet. And it's very, very difficult for near-death experiencers to come to the decision that they're going to return to Earth, often to a world of hurt and pain, recovering from their life-threatening event. And yet, obviously, these near-death experiencers ultimately do decide to return. They want to come back because of some types of lessons that they need to learn. And it's important for them to come back to complete learning those lessons. Can you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's had a near-death experience? As soon as they start to recover and get over this incredible traumatic event, there's a lot going on in their mind, they may not even know for sure that they're going to survive and go on living. I was sort of overloaded with what had just happened with me. It was, it was though I was a, an appliance built for 110 volts plugged into 220. I went through a long period.